Hello, uh, we're going to continue showing in the first bank here, but I'd like to be uh, okay. Uh, our next talk, uh, we have a presentation by uh, it's uh, uh, and she's going to talk about the uh, uh, PSID as I know as I know it, and especially she will talk about the child development support, uh, which is uh, we are quite interested in. Uh, on this uh, child development supplement because uh, <laughs> uh, well, thank you very much, Alfonso, for the introduction and the invitation. And thank you to Steve, Steve and Vicky for organizing this event. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, many years ago, as a graduate student, I was involved in data collection on a family health and migration study nearby in San Francisco. But my Spanish has only deteriorated since then, so I will not subject you to that. Uh, but I'm very glad to be here and to be about a longitudinal data collection textbook. So the purpose of this conversation is to, to describe the child development supplement that is embedded in a panel study of infant So this is a really unique design in that it's a very it's a specialized study with a target population. It's a supplement to, to a longer running, bigger study. And so there are some things that gave it some unique strengths. And there are also some kind of unusual constraints in a study of this design that I'll describe. So the panel study of income dynamics, as many of you may know, is a US national sample that began with 5,000 families in 1968 for many of the reasons that we heard about from Linda and Luis earlier today, particularly to understand poverty dynamics and to understand the risk of falling into and the uh, mechanisms for moving out of poverty over the life course and over time. The study has persisted since 1968 and it has a genealogical design, which means that as children have grown up and moved into their own households, they have become sample members and have been followed themselves. And so we're now into studying children in the fifth and sixth generations of their PSID families. So the active sample today has nearly 10,000 families and about 25,000 people observed in households. So those individuals I described who move into their own household units are called split-offs. Typically, this occurs when adults grow up and establish their own households. It also may happen when parents divorce and children move into separate households. And then we have a unique opportunity to follow the economic circumstances of children in their new households as well as their non-resident households, which is a really distinctive element of the study that's unusual for studying how family structure and family structure change affects children. The study includes an oversample of African Americans and low income households. One cost to having a panel study like this is that, as we heard, the sample becomes less representative over time as a result of uh, immigration. And so in 1997, an immigrant refresher was added. About 500 families were added, half of whom were Latino and 21% Asian. And we have another immigrant refresher planned for 2017. To date, PSID has collected 38 waves of data from families over 47 years. It was an annual study up until 1997 and has been uh, biannual or every other year since then. And one <coughs> impressive facet of the study is that they do consistently achieve extremely high wave-to-wave -wave response rates, usually um, above 90%. So this is just an illustration of the study design of the genealogical design that I mentioned. If you think about the couple at the top as the first generation of PSID householders, uh, male, male uh, head and spouse, 
and think of them as having had four children. Each of those four children eventually becomes their own householder and becomes a PSID respondent themselves, and then they go on to have children who eventually become PSID respondents. And you can see that we have the data available on those solid lines to directly link people intergenerationally in their immediate families, but the dotted lines also indicate how individuals are related to extended families so that we can study how aunts and uncles, cousins in other households may be affecting the well-being of individuals living in, a, living in a common household. So some of the research strengths of the design of the PSID are that it's longitudinal and it is multi-generational. And so one thing that this allows us to do is consider how people, how individuals gain or lose economic, social, and personal resources like health over their lifetime. So there's an intragenerational benefit from a, multi, from a longitudinal design like PSID. The multi-generational design allows us to see how and when resources like these are transferred from parents to children. And we can also consider the circumstances under which children may achieve greater social mobility or less social mobility than might have been anticipated uh, as a result of shocks, as a result of their individual characteristics, as a result of policy change, and so on. And finally, we can look at how families contribute to social and economic inequality over time. There are many drivers of inequality, many structural drivers, changes of occupation structure, and so on. And we can ask, in the context of many drivers of social changes in social inequality, to what extent do families uniquely contribute to that? So there are many there are many benefits to using PSID to studying for studying intergenerational mobility. But one thing that the core survey lacks is a great deal of information about children. So PSID can tell us a lot about social and economic mobility between generations once individuals are in adulthood. But it tells us less about what happens to children in families that shapes their adult outcomes. So in the PSID interview, we observe children. We know they're there. We know when they're born. We know who they're living with. We know when they move out. But we don't really know what kinds of interactions they're having with parents. We don't know what kind of school quality they're experiencing. We don't know what kinds of developmental challenges they're encountering that might shape their transition into adulthood. So this lack of information was one of the motivations for embedding a child development supplement in PSID. It would have been costly and very time consuming to add questions about children into the core interview, which is already about 75 minutes in length. And child development studies typically require a different design, one that often requires face-to-face -face contact. And the PSID interview has been defunct on mostly by telephone for at least 30 years now. So in response to all of these reasons to think about including, uh, developing a child study, the PSID, first PSID child development supplement began in 1997. And the design was to include up to two children living in a PSID family unit who were between 0 and 12 years of age in that year. And so this is one of the interesting kinds of constraints. We just have the sample that we have. This is who is living in families at the time. We couldn't make this sample any bigger without bringing in other families to the study. So we had ended up with about 3,600 children living in 2,400 PSID families. And this study had a cohort design with three rounds of data collection. That initial effort in 97, another effort five years later in 2002, and another effort five years after that in 2007. And again, the response rates were lower for this than they are for the core, but they were fairly high for a study of this. And so this is another illustration. If you think about the bottom row this time being children, this is children living in PSID households. The first box illustrates a, on the bottom row illustrates a family with three children, all of whom would have been age eligible, but one of those children was excluded because we were taking only two children from households. And then in the third box, you can see there are two children in the household, but only one is age eligible. The second child in gray is 13 years old. So we did not collect information on children who were adolescents when the study started. And then <coughs> and on the far side, we see that we see a family member who has not yet had any children. And so that individual is not going to contribute any children to the design of CDS over its, over its lifetime. But the design of the study in the field was that it was done in person as home visits. 
and we uh, conducted interviews with a person identified as a child's primary caregiver and a secondary <coughs> caregiver. Most often, this the primary caregiver was a mother and a secondary caregiver was a father, although sometimes it might have been a grandmother or another relative. And those interviews were collected mostly by phone. And then we went into the field and conducted interviews in person with children and used an audio computer assisted self interview component for sensitive interview content uh, with children who are 8 to 17 years old. A unique piece of the study was that we collected time values for children. And I'm happy to answer more questions about this. But this is essentially a 24 hour inventory of how children spend all of their time on one weekday and one weekend day. And these have been used to develop really rich and rigorous profiles of exactly how children spend their time. Not in stylized measures, but their actual time use. And I'll give you some examples of how those have been used in research today. We also conducted a cognitive achievement test in reading and math with both the child and the primary caregiver. And we did anthropometric measurements of height and weight. And then we also were able to link the, we got the, uh, we knew which neighborhoods children were living in and we got the school name so that we could link to contextual data about children's schools. The content of the questionnaire included some of the greatest hits from research on child development. So we have rich information on children's health and behavior from standard, uh, standard uh, psychometric assessments, the cognitive achievement measures that I mentioned. We have a lot of information about what's happening interpersonally in the household in terms of family routines, discipline practices, family, family conflict. We get information from the caregivers about their attitudes about parenting. We find out about learning resources in the home, so access to a computer, to books, uh, whether time watching television is limited. Uh, we have psychometric measures of the caregiver's mental health and self-esteem. We have information about children's experience of school and how involved their parents are in their education. We have stylized measures of children's time use to complement the time diaries. And then the older children, 12 to 17, reported on their, on their families and school experiences, their social activities, their sexual activity and drug and alcohol use, and other um, sensitive topics. So once these children reached age 17, they were no longer considered children. And as you might have calculated, uh, the oldest children in the cohort, the, who were between 8 and 12 when the study began, were beyond, beyond childhood when the third wave of CDS occurred in 2007. So we developed another study called the Transition into Adulthood <coughs> Study. And all children in the CDS cohort have eventually been absorbed into the transition to adulthood study, which begins when children are 18. And so the reason that we developed this particular piece was that the traditional model for PSID was the children uh, were stayed in their households until they married and moved into their they moved into a separate household in their early 20s, and we had a sort of seamless transition. What we see, and we were able to start collecting information on these young adults as they were going through critical stages because they were household heads. With the extension of the transition into adulthood, we saw children staying in their parents' households longer. They were not study respondents. And so a lot of things were happening, including their education, they were beginning to work, they were forming unions and having children, but not necessarily setting up their own households. The transition into adulthood is meant to ca capture information from directly from these young adults before they become household heads. And so we're observing this critical, these critical life stage transitions that they go through, such as finishing education, starting work, forming families, even before they're in their own households. And so now they're interviewed every two years from 2005 to 2015. And uh, so roughly we're capturing them when they're 18 to 27 years old. And the content of that interview largely overlaps with the child development supplement interview and the main adult interview, in addition to having some life stage specific items. And again, the wave to wave response rates tend to be around 98%. So just to give you a rough idea of what this actually looks like in practice, if you imagine two children going to the same family who, absorbed, who showed up in CDS, the older child born in 1988 would have been observed the first, for the first time she was nine years old. She was observed again in the second wave of CDS as a 14-year-old. And then she had aged into adulthood by the time CDS 3 occurred. So she was in the transition into adulthood study and observed five times between nine, ages 19 and 27. 
Her younger brother was an infant in 1996 and was observed three times in CBS as a one-year-old, a six-year-old, and an 11-year-old. And then we didn't observe him again until he entered the transition into adulthood study as a 19-year-old. You can see through this design when we have a fairly wide, uh, a wide age range for the cohort, it means that we end up having a variable number of observations on the children in the sample, and that we're seeing them at different developmental stages. So it's different from a cohort study like the Millennium Cohort Study, which picks up children about, that have a common mode birth cohort at the same age in every way. So some innovative research from CDS and the transition into adulthood study. First, I mentioned the time diaries. One of the most useful ways that the time diaries have been used is really just, as I said, to sort of inventory how children spend their days. Beyond that, the data have been used for looking at how uh, time use at one point in time impacts outcomes at another point in time. So this piece by Hofer looks at children's home media use, the television and computer use, and, and looks at their eventual, their uh, achievement and behaviors five years later when they're in adolescence. The time, use, the, the time diaries have also been used to look at how parents' time overlaps with children's time. And so a recent piece by Shin and Feld looked at how children's time spent with mothers is related to their cognitive achievement, and particularly the time they spend engaged in educational and structured activities. So this again gets to a very sort of life course and intergenerational perspective to how we think about the way children spend their time. So these data are also useful, obviously, for longitudinal analysis. So just thinking about time, longitudinal analysis within individuals, a recent piece by Scott South and Lay looked at children at the timing of children's home leaving and, their, and whether they ever return to the parental home. So again, with cross-sectional data, it would be very hard to know when you're, if you see a child in their parents' home, if they've had a delayed leaving and they've left and come back for some reason. So this kind of longitudinal data, data allowed the authors to track returns to the parent home and to find some really interesting triggers for returning to home including the experience of physical violence and parents' poor health as causes of both delayed home leaving and home return for young adults. And then finally, when we pair CDS with the study in which it's embedded, PSID, there's real power for doing intergenerational analysis. And so for scholars of social mobility, the work that Patrick Sharkey has been doing is I think particularly innovative. This piece that I'm citing from the American Journal of Sociology shows that when a parent has grown up in a poor neighborhood, the cognitive ability of his child in the next generation is negatively affected. So even if that child is growing up in a better off neighborhood, the intergenerational consequences of the parent's exposure to neighborhood poverty has a lasting effect on child development and well-being. And then thinking more from a public health perspective, Elizabeth Van der Water had a recent paper showing the, the, a pretty constant transmission of the risk of smoking from parents to children over the past 45 years. So even though we've moved from very different paradigms in public health and thinking about the risk of smoking, there's a very, con a very persistent effect of parents smoking on children's risk of smoking all of that has been done with data on children who have been teenagers into adulthood, and so what about, what about the new generation of children? So PSID just launched the 2014 Child Development Supplement, which was, has collected data on PSID children who were living in family, PSID families in 2013. And so we've been, we completed field work with a sample of children uh, in April of this year. And we changed the design of the study a bit to include all children in families from age 0 to 17. And our goal, like HRS, is to move from a cohort model to a steady state model, where we're collecting data on all PSID children every six years. So in that steady state, each wave will add new children who have been born since the previous wave, and we'll have observed children three times from birth to age 17. And this allows numerous cohort and period comparisons. 
Uh, the data in this study were collected not only not entirely in person, we did this by telephone, by mail, and in person. And so the, the interviews were done primarily by phone, and then we had in person supplement for cattle and animals. And our eligible sample included about 5,800 children and 3,000 families. So I just want to, just about these out of order, I just want to, I want to go back to this uh, illustration I used earlier to show that this new design now means that we'll be including all children in households. So where there are three children in a household, we can see them all. Where there are children in the, who are teenagers, we'll see them. And anyone who's born after 2014 will eventually pick up the next time the CDS is in the so some of the neat things about having a new wave of CDS include that about one quarter of the children in this new study will have a parent who is a member of the original CDS cohort. So now we have really rich child development data across two generations. Another is that we can now do cohort, we can look at cohort differences in children who were born between 1985 and 1997 and compare those cohorts to children born more recently. I think perhaps most importantly is that CDS is unique in the United States right now. There are no other nationally represented longitudinal <coughs> studies of children that are planned or underway. And obviously this complements other international child studies like the Australian study and the British studies that we heard about earlier today. So uh, we've added, as we heard from the symbols, that the content that people are interested in changes over time. So one thing we're doing is linking to individual and, and the ways that we, the data we use also change over time. So in this wave of CDS, we're asking for permission to link to administrative records, including the birth records for children and their caregivers, and to the school records of children who are at least eight years old, so we can have their state standardized test scores. For the first time, we're collecting saliva samples for subsequent genetic analysis. This is a really great design because we're getting this from the children and from their primary caregiver, which is usually somebody we're related to. So we're going to have two generations of genetic information. And we also revised the questionnaire content. I think one of the most interesting pieces is that we included an extensive set of questions on computer and media use about children's behaviors with uh, computers, television, uh, all kinds of electronic devices, the rules in their household, how much both they and their parents actually know about, um, on, about media and, uh, and online activity. And we also have updated the content we uh, collect on drug and alcohol use, and we've added measures on children's post-social behavior in response to increasing uh, interest in that topic. So the future developments for CDS, for the first and foremost, that we'll be releasing in these data next spring. We've also received support to launch a new transition into adulthood study for these children so we can continue to follow them as they enter adulthood. As I mentioned, there will be an immigrant pressure in 2016-2017, which is particularly important for studies for children because that's where problems with representativeness become most apparent and the youngest, uh, youngest segment of the population. We plan to conduct the next round of the Child Development Supplement in 2020. And our goal is to eventually collect saliva samples and genetic markers for the remainder of the PSID sample, including households that do not currently have children. Uh, so we'll eventually have that from all 25,000 active households. So you can get more information about PSID online, and I just wanted to mention my collaborators, principal investigator, Ryan Sastry, and our co-investigator, Kate Thank you.